It's Thursday night and you're watching Crypto Trader, the world's first broadcast cryptocurrency investment show. So, for those of you who thought that the crypto world was coming to an end this week, welcome to crypto. For those of us who've been here for a while, we know that when crypto goes down like that, all we need to do is stop, switch off our monitors and huddle. So what actually happened? What actually happened was that the People's Bank of China, the Chinese Central Bank, turned around and said that they were going to start investigating ICOs. And in this document that they released, they said that while they're investigating, they may actually ban ICOs in the interim. Two days later, in true person, a People's Bank of China style, they issue a memorandum that says that all ICOs are not only illegal, but if you've raised money in an ICO, you now have to give all the money back. I'd like to see how that plays out. Stephen, the People's Bank of China choosing to regulate ICOs, good thing or bad thing? Uh, the quick exit from China and ICOs, thanks to the PBOC, has to be viewed from two perspectives, right? So ICO platform and holders quickly getting cold feet due to regulatory scrutiny and markets reacting and dissolving themselves at risk accordingly. And on the other end, the BTC on-ramps themselves, seeing as Bitcoin is still the most liquid and accessible digital asset, also took a short break from individuals buying new Bitcoin in order to get into these ICOs. So many of these firms and exchanges in China are diversifying or simply exiting their positions altogether due to not quite understanding the full implications and specifics of the notice at first. So a panic reaction is expected, but it's not surprised. But Stephen, is it a good thing or a bad thing that the PBOC is actually regulating in this case? It's a good thing. I mean, obviously we want a, uh, an unregulated market without scams. That would be ideal. Um, but to think that we can, we can go the rest of this way and you know, bring forth adoption without having to at some point deal with some sort of like regulatory scrutiny would be silly. Uh, and it's only these countries and these you know, uh, regulatory bodies and governments just protecting themselves accordingly. And you know, with all this irrational exuberance going on, they're, all they're trying to do most likely is just to protect consumers as much as they can. And it might see a little bit overreaching, but they're trying to do what's, what's best for the people. Stephen, in other news, I heard that Sequoia is investing in Bitcoin mining. What do you know about that? The move from both Sequoia to invest in the largest mining manufacturer in the world it seems to like set a, a pretty decent precedent going forward. And this could be a clear signal that major players are poised to move in a big way in the next coming months. Um, Bitmain has an AI research facility in Israel that opened earlier this year. And as Bitmain plans to expand its operations in the US to diversify some of its hash rate out of China, these other firms want in on the fund, like Sequoia. So, you know, Sequoia also recently backed Naval Ravikant's crypto hedge fund Metastable, uh, as well as Polychain Capital. So it seems to me that a lot of early leaders are emerging uh, in crypto investing now since we're going into this like next major phase uh, in adoption. And it seems that people are getting really serious about where crypto is headed in the short term. I see a lot of celebrities promoting ICOs. I saw Floyd Mayweather promoting an ICO. And then I saw Paris Hilton promoting an ICO. Yeah, I mean, that, that, was, that was crazy to me too. But, you know, it's not surprising given the entry of other celebs uh, recently, like Floyd Mayweather. Um, who promoted an, a few ICOs recently, I believe two, and he may be even backing a, a token that's the, that Burger King is putting out uh, in Russia, if, if, I, if I remember correctly. Um, other rappers like The Game and even professional soccer players are kind of like leaking into crypto as crypto leaks into the mainstream. And now whether or not Paris Hilton is reading white papers and doing token security audits, can't be quite certain about that. But what I can say is that it appears most of these figures may or may not be doing the appropriate due diligence. Their lawyers might be trying to do the best they can, they can but you know, this, this field is very complex. So it's important that even celebrities are careful not to burn their social capital. Perhaps this is just what the PBOC itself is scared of. Celebrities promoting things they may not understand and financially burdening their fan base. There's a big difference between investing in crypto and trading crypto. Now there's a lot of money to be made in both, but the question is, which one do you choose? To help us talk about the difference is Zach Hamilton, and he's the founder at General Crypto Fund. Zach, what's the difference between investing in crypto and trading crypto? The difference between trading and investing, I think, is really time frame based, um, and it's also value driven. Um, you know, the, the charts and the prices are, are very important in our day to day, uh, but what is the most important is the underlying value that's being created in the market. Um, how these tokens are being used uh, to create value in business, uh, whichever silo or whichever industry you may be in. So what do you guys do at General Crypto? So we are a long only hedge fund, uh, meaning that we go and seek these mid cap, we call them currencies, uh, tokens, coins, uh, and 
companies that are really creating some sort of value in business. Um, that could be international payments, that could be anything from uh, privacy coins to file storage or really anything where blockchain is applicable and also where this token is expressing the value being created in the market in the traded price of the token. So we look at these just like startups. We think these are early, early stage technology companies uh, and we do diligence on them as such. Tell me about the verticals that you're investing in and then the tokens that you're looking at at each one of the verticals. So we look at you know tons and tons of them, but I think the, the ones that are coming to, into play right now more than anything else um, is payments, uh, international payments specifically. So we see the international payment silo as really being run by Ripple. Um, I'm a huge fan of Ripple. We've been investors in that and the other fund I was part of uh, from an equity standpoint for a long time. Um, I think they're doing excellent work. Um, they're a very professional team, uh, well-funded, all sorts of stuff. Um, Omasi Go, or Amos, however you, you may say it, I think is doing excellent things also in the underbanked sector. Um, so all of this international payment silo, I'm big, big, big fan of. Um, the next silo, I guess, would be decentralized file storage um, that we're starting to look into. Uh, we experienced an investment in Space Monkey, uh, one of the uh, original decent file storage using the BitTorrent protocol that launched a few years too early. Um, and we're seeing a lot of that happen now with uh, Filecoin, with SiaCoin, with MadeSafe, uh, with Storage. Um, all of them have, you know, a little bit of differences between them. Uh, so we focus mostly on their usage in the market uh, and how we place our investment there. There seems to be a large and growing market for anonymity coins or privacy coins. With me in the studio, I've got Ricardo Spagni and he's the lead contributor to the Monero project. Ricardo, thanks for coming on the show. Tell us a little bit about Monero. Why do we need a coin like Monero? It's a very good question, Ran. Uh, for the most part, a lot of people don't need privacy-focused tools at all, but there are a large portion of the population that do need them. And they're, for example, people who want to pay for something and don't want the person they're paying to see their bank balance or their Bitcoin balance, uh, and they don't want the person who they're paying to be able to see what they've spent money on. So, you know, pro-privacy projects in general are important not just for um, people who are trying to evade governments or evade the law, but for a large portion of the population. And how do you achieve this privacy? I mean, everyone thinks that Bitcoin is quite a private network. We know it's not. How do you guys achieve this privacy? Sure. So Monero focuses on four aspects of privacy. The first thing it focuses on is uh, hiding the ability to see where a transaction is coming from. And we use something called ring signatures for that. The second thing is hiding the ability to see where a transaction is going to. And we use something called stealth addresses. The third thing is hiding the amount that's transacted, and we use something called Ring CT, which is based on Greg Maxwell's confidential transactions. And the fourth thing is hiding the IP address that a transaction originates from, and we have a project called Covery for that. So you really are creating this coin where you can't see anything about the transactions. Is it optional or, or is it automatic that everything's hidden? So it's private by default, but you can opt out of it by revealing your view key either to the world or to a select number of people. What about all the accusations that this is used for the dark web and for people who are buying drugs and for people who want to be anonymous for all the wrong reasons? When it comes to things like privacy enhancing tools, your pri your, not your primary users, but your initial users might be people who are using it for nefarious reasons. There's nothing you can do about that. It just so happens that, um, that people who are buying drugs on the dark web uh, are the sort of people that need privacy most of all. But Obviously, we're writing software. We don't look at individual use cases. We try and focus on important um, use cases that we've identified. For example, somebody who lives in an oppressive regime who's trying to buy something that we might find innocuous, uh, but the government that they live under simply doesn't approve of that purchase. And if they go and do that, their life might be at stake. But essentially what you're saying is that that is to bypass governments. I mean, you're using anonymity or privacy to, to bypass government rules. Um, even though it's in a country that we don't agree with their laws, we're still bypassing the rules. And that could put regulators onto the blockchain to say, look, let's look at all these currencies on the blockchain and maybe start regulating them. Is that not one of the big risks? Well, it is. Um in fact, you're not really trying to bypass governments, you're trying to bypass attackers. And an attacker could be a criminal that's trying to identify, you know, somebody who has a lot of cryptocurrency to go and steal from them. Um, and an attacker could, in some circumstances, be a government or even a regulator. And the fact of the matter is that tools exist uh, today that we use on a daily basis that can be used in nefarious ways, like 
motor vehicles and kitchen knives, but that doesn't mean that we stop making motor vehicles or we stop making kitchen knives. It doesn't mean that regulators say, well, we need to you know, build motor vehicles without seat belts so that if a terrorist uses it, it's not safe. Uh, it just means that you have to, um, that, that the regulators have to focus on good old fashioned police work instead of things like passive surveillance. Certainly a very big market. You guys have got a massive developer community. Tell us a bit about your contribution community or your developer community. Sure. So across the Monero projects we have uh, just over 280 contributors that have worked on Monero over the course of its lifetime, so over the past three and a half years. Of those 280, about 40 or 50 um, are active at any point in time. Um, contributors come and go, some of them are there for a while and disappear, some of them have been around for ages. Um, and we, we encourage contributors, we have a variety of projects that use a, a number of different programming languages. People can come and work on translations, uh, they can work on the website and on the website content. So because we have this broad, open, welcoming development community, we've attracted a lot of contributors. How did you get involved in this project? Where did, where did this come from? Sure, so well, Monero was launched by a guy called Thankful for Today uh, on Bitcoin Talk. He's pseudonymous, we don't know who he really is. And I was one of the people that started mining Monero on day zero when he launched it. Uh, and uh, eventually became part of a core team of seven people that took stewardship of the project when Thankful for Today started doing things the community didn't agree with. So in true blockchain style, you're not the owner of the project, you're just the lead maintainer of the project. Correct. Let's talk about mining Monero. Profitable or not profitable? It depends on a number of factors. Typically with altcoin mining, uh, if you mine, by the time the coins have actually, uh, are actually available for you to send to an exchange, that altcoin might have changed in terms of market value. So you don't necessarily want to mine and then sell immediately, and you don't want to base your profitability calculations on that either. So Monero can be profitable if you're mining and then at some particular, or at some point, like at the end of the month, you're selling a portion to cover electricity and holding the rest until some future time when you see massive accumulation or massive increase in the, in the price. So, is Bitcoin a bubble or is Bitcoin not in a bubble? With me in the studio, I've got Lou Klaassen, who's an executive director of the Bitcoin Foundation. Lou, Bitcoin a bubble? Or not a bubble? Ryan, I think that it's easy to dismiss the kind of exuberance that people have for this new technology and this new currency that is not controlled by governance and, uh, governments and read that as it is a fad, it's something that doesn't have any inherent value and therefore we must dismiss it or that there is some kind of correction that is going to be permanent and, and is going to wipe out most of the value of this thing. And the reality is that yes, there, is, uh, there are a lot of unsophisticated investors getting into this space I think that there was a really good article this morning in Seeking Alpha which kind of suggests that right now based upon utility and comparisons to things like gold, a Bitcoin is probably worth about $5,800. So at $4,300 or $4,000 it's probably undervalued. Will there be corrections at least in the short term? Absolutely. I think that what we've established is that Bitcoin kind of responds quite strongly to positive and negative news. But in the long term, it's usually a pretty good store of value, at least when we say long term. In crypto, we're probably talking like six months, 12 months. So you've got this, you, you called it a currency, we're going to get back to that debate, but you've got this currency that appreciates in value consistently. I mean, this, this has gone from $1,000 a year ago to $5,000 this year. How is that not a bubble? So you've got 21 million of these things that are ever going to be issued. You've had less than 17 million of them that have been issued. And if everybody around the world said, I would also like to have one of these things that enables me to store money outside of the control of a bank or a government, guess what? We don't have enough of them. And if everybody's holding on to them, then we've got an escalation in price. So the deflationary of nature of Bitcoin is what drives the price of Bitcoin. And yes, of course, there is short term speculation. But in the long term, uh, we expect that the price will go up and to the right. But why do I need a Bitcoin when there's a thousand other cryptocurrencies that do the same thing and some of them probably even do it better? Why, why Bitcoin? So I think that everybody would agree that if you look at the share of market that Bitcoin has and the amount of hash power that gets dedicated to that network, that it is going to be the dominant chain for a very long time and the dominant currency. So, you know, it is a provider of liquidity by nature of so many people holding the coins and there being so much value that has already been uh, been earned uh, in, in that currency. So 
Yes, of course, there are other chains. Yes, of course, they have other features. And I think that there's a time and a place for those other things. But I think that at least in the, for the next while, Bitcoin is going to be the dominant form of cryptocurrency. Lou, you called Bitcoin a currency. Uh, this currency costs about $7.50 to trade with, which means that I can't buy a cup of coffee using this currency. So is it a gold or is it a currency? So I think for the last two and a half years to three years, it's absolutely been better as a form of gold than it has been as a form of cash. But fortunately for us, two weeks ago, when segregated witness activated on the network and where we have lightning that is coming up in the next couple of months, we're going to be able to buy a cup of coffee using Bitcoin. And I think that that's just a, a, you know, a reflection of the fact that this, this technology is maturing in many ways what some of the things that people are most excited to use it for, not necessarily buying a cup of coffee, but, but you know, doing a lot of other things that they would like to do with it. You're right, transaction fees have been high for a long time, but I think that the layer two solutions like Lightning definitely change that. High, not only high, but high and slow, which led to the introduction of Bitcoin Cash. So with segregated witness, which is an upgrade to the Bitcoin network, do you think there's a need for this Bitcoin Cash coin? Do you think that the price at $600 a coin, more or less, is justified? I would like to believe that everybody has a right to do with the technology what they want, including creating another coin. As to whether or not that coin will survive, we will have to see. Are you holding your Bitcoin Cash coins? No. So Lou, your partner Vinny Lingham tweeted something earlier this week and he asked, if you could hold a coin for five years and you couldn't sell the coin, would you hold Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, or Bitcoin Cash? One coin for five years, no selling. Absolutely BTC. So you're a Bitcoin man through and through. I am, but I do think that there is an opportunity for those other coins. So it's not like there is no time and place for them, but if I had to, if you had me, if I had to pick one, it would be Bitcoin. I really hope there is a time and place for the other coins because next up on our show, we have Charlie Lee, who is the founder of the Litecoin project. Charlie Lee, tell us, wh what are you doing in the blockchain and why did you found Litecoin? I founded Litecoin uh, six years ago, uh, decided to kind of play around with the Bitcoin code base and wanted to create my own fork. So I did that for fun and it's become a lot more than I expected. So for fun, you decided to play with the Bitcoin code and you created a new coin called Litecoin, which reached some significant milestones this week. I saw it trading at a market cap of over $3 billion. Do you think that's justified? Are there enough people using Litecoin? Actually, it traded over $4 billion market cap uh, a couple of days ago. I think it's just like all these other coins, including Bitcoin, it's, it's speculations, right? It's speculators that are, um, that are speculating that Bitcoin and Litecoin and other cryptocurrencies will become really big in the future. So they're betting big into it today. And whether or not it deserves a $4 billion market cap, it's basically what the market says, right? Charlie, you've often been referred to as Bitcoin's younger brother. Um, and that's probably because you use the Bitcoin code. What's the difference between Bitcoin and Litecoin? When I created Litecoin, I positioned it as silver to Bitcoin's gold. So the, the idea was to create something that was faster, more plentiful version of Bitcoin. And having a smaller team and smaller market cap also means we're more nimble and can add new features sooner than Bitcoin. For example, this year we activated SegWit in April and it took Bitcoin until just recently to activate SegWit. So we kind of paved the way to help Bitcoin test SegWit. How many developers work on Litecoin? How many contributors? In terms of the core team, there's uh, five developers. Uh, we have a lot of, um, it's an open source project, so we have a lot of people helping us out and just contributing to the open source project. And in terms of transaction fees and transaction speed, what's quicker, Bitcoin or Litecoin? Definitely Litecoin. Litecoin has four times the, the block size and also is four times faster in terms of block time. So with Bitcoin, it averages 10 minutes and for Litecoin, it averages two and a half minutes per block. And the transaction fees are much lower for Litecoin uh, about like in terms of like a few cents as opposed to like upwards of $10 for Bitcoin. How many vendors in the world use Litecoin or accept Litecoin as a form of payment? In terms of merchants, it's definitely less than Bitcoin. Uh, Litecoin is less well known, uh, but it's, it's uh, increase, adoption is increasing in terms of uh, merchant space. Uh, we have like payment processors like Goldcoin accepting Litecoin and helps merchants easily convert Litecoin to their fiat currencies. 
How many tokens are in circulation and, and how many are going to be the maximum that are ever issued? Uh, maximum ever issued is 84 million. So it's four times the max amount of Bitcoins. And currently there's about a little bit over 50 million Litecoins uh, already issued. And Charlie, what can we expect in the next three to six months coming out of Litecoin? Are there any exciting innovations that we can look forward to? Yeah, two things that I would like to add to Litecoin is uh, more of a smart contract uh, capability similar to Ethereum. And the second thing is um, something similar to um, uh, confidential transactions. One of the things that Bitcoin and Litecoin is missing in terms of like good money is fungibility. That is the ability to send payments and for the recipient to not be able to distinguish between the Bitcoins that you sent them or Bitcoins and Litecoins that you sent them. Currently, if you send coins to someone, they can see the whole history of the coin. So confidential transaction, what that does is it hides the, the amount. So you don't know how many coins were sent with the transaction. And if you add that with something like um, coin join, then you can make the whole uh, transaction history private or fungible. And that makes it uh, really a better version, better form of money because with money, you don't want people to be able to know like how much you made or where you spent your money by just transacting with someone. Chris Dunn TV is a YouTube channel with over 100,000 subscribers. And most of their content turns out to be cryptocurrency related. With me on the show, I've got Chris Dunn, who's the founder of Chris Dunn TV. And he's also an amazing crypto trader. Chris, you're a crypto trader. What are we buying? What are we selling and why? That's right. Yeah, I'm both a uh, crypto trader and investor. And I've been long Bitcoin for several years now. And um, I like to accumulate it when it's cheap. 2015, we were around the two to three hundred dollar mark. And recently we've just seen incredible explosive growth this year. Um, we're up about 400 percent this year and about 70 percent in the past month. Um, so been buying dips and taking breakouts and um, also been trading a lot of altcoins recently. So Chris, let's talk about Bitcoin first. $4,500, are you buying or are you selling? I've recently been selling over the past couple of days and weeks. Um, as I'm sure you know, China just recently released some news that they were banning new ICOs, which caused a little bit of panic. Uh, in the markets, but that has quickly subsided and we've seen a bounce over the past couple of days. Um, so long term, I'm bullish on Bitcoin. In the short term, I'm going to continue to buy dips and breakout patterns. Uh, but every time the market has a parabolic move to the upside or has massive gains in a short period of time, I think the smart thing to do is take some profit off of the table. Chris, let's look at the Bitcoin chart that you sent us. What is this chart telling us? So this is just showing the uh, price data since the beginning of the year. Um, you can see that price dipped below a thousand. Actually in January, China also came out with some news that was uh, not exactly favorable for cryptocurrencies, but you can see the, the market quickly shook that off. And you know, I call Bitcoin kind of the honey badger of money because no matter what gets thrown at it, it just keeps moving higher. And um, you can see here in the early spring to early summer, that's when we saw a lot of growth. You know, just in altcoins alone, the total market cap has gone from about $2 billion to about $100 billion. And so what this Bitcoin chart is representing is just um, market sentiment really waking up and people around the world understanding that Bitcoin is here to stay. You also sent me a, a chart on Dash. Are you buying or selling based on this chart? Based on this chart, I'm just holding. So we've been long Dash for over a year now. And uh, you can also see in the beginning of the year, uh, Dash was sitting around 10 or $20 and most recently just topped out around 400. Ethereum Classic is really interesting. You can see over the past couple of months, we've actually been channeling in between $13 and $23. And I'm watching to see if we're gonna get another breakout above 23 or $24. But this is also one that we've been holding for several months. What what about Ethereum? Ethereum can't break $400. No matter how hard we try, Ethereum's not breaking $400. Why? Well, so you can see over the past uh, couple of months, we've also had really strong resistance around $400 after, again, just explosive growth since the beginning of the year. And um, most recently, we put in a double top. So we've been taking profit on this into the, uh, the resistance area. But this is another one that 
you know, it has significant downside risk because so many new ICOs are tied to it. But this is another one that, again, if it breaks that 400 level, I think we could see another follow on trend. I think the last graph you sent me was the Ripple graph. Now, we love Ripple on the show. Based on the graph, should we be buying it, selling it or holding it? So right now you can also see this is another one that had massive growth in the beginning of the year. And anytime that a market takes off and it has too, too big of a run to the upside and goes parabolic, it's kind of like a rocket taking off. When it runs out of fuel, it comes back just as hard. But you can see that it's found its support here over the past couple of months. Um, so I like Ripple, but we took significant profit here in May on the, uh, the really big run to the upside. So I think if, again, just like a lot of the other charts right now, after they've had such explosive growth, I'm actually holding a lot of things waiting for the next market cycle. Um, you know, a lot of people like to say that um, altcoins or even Bitcoin is in a bubble. Um, and I think long term, I expect Bitcoin and altcoins growth to continue to grow. But in the short term, we go through many cycles. So right now we're kind of on the backside of that bull cycle. So a lot of things I'm actually just holding now, but just like on the Ethereum's, if Ripple can give another breakout above that prior resistance, I think that's where the next really smart buying opportunity would come in. So it's been a roller coaster week on the crypto market. For those of you who are new to the market, get used to it because this is what crypto does. Up 30% and down 30% in the same week is a huge possibility. If you've got any questions about the market, you can get me on Twitter at CryptoManRun anytime and I'll help you make sense of the markets. Until next week, Thursday night, hold on tight.